Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, um, which uh, half organized tonight's event. Uh, first, uh, Adam Hirschfelder uh, organized the event. Uh, he's the one that got it started, um, and then it got handed off to us. And uh, so we're doing it, and uh, we're very happy to be doing it because, uh, first of all, I knew Kevin Starr and uh, knew his work as well, and it's uh, just a pleasure to be here to talk about his work. So, um, I, another thing I'd like to mention is that Sheila Starr, uh, Kevin's widow, is here with us tonight in person. So, um, just two really minor th things. Uh, if you have a phone, please turn it off uh, so that it doesn't make any noise during the recording. And uh, second, we will be taking questions for the panel. Um, and when we take those questions, we can take them in one of two different ways. You can either if, uh, write it out on a card and I'll collect it, or uh, if you would like to ask it directly, I'll come with a microphone and we'll be doing that in about 45, 50 minutes. But first, before the panel comes on stage, um, we have taken out of our archives, uh, Kevin speaking uh, at the 75th anniversary of the Golden Gate Bridge, and uh, it's from 2012, and so you can see Kevin in action. So that's what we'll start with. The, uh, of the, uh, the exploration of the American Corps of Topographical Engineers, he wrote the report with the help of his wife, Jesse Benton Fremont, uh, named uh, Chrysopoli the Golden Gate, and it's not the gold of the gold rush. It's the gold of the Golden Horn, the port leading into um, Istanbul, uh, classical Constantinople, because Fremont says in that report, someday a great city will rise up on the shores of this bay, and we're going to name it after the uh, entrance to the great city of Istanbul. The color of the bridge. Tell us this famous story, whoever would like to. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just give it a try. Um, it, with the, and you mentioned earlier the Panama Pacific Exposition of, of 15. Uh, that, the exposition had a, uh, a color consultant, <laughs> uh, uh, Jules Guérin, who's a French, a French uh, architect and with, a, with emphasis on color. He uh, understood color. And he studied very carefully the atmospherics of, the, of San Francisco Bay, the Bayside, with the marvelous changes of light, the, the fog, the the, m the mixture of sunshine and maritime weather, all those th the, the atmospheric, very distinctive atmospherics. And he came up with a palette of colors for the Panama Pacific. If you've seen colored pictures of the Pacific uh, buildings, they were remarkable colors. Yeah. Cinnabar and mauve, and one of them was uh, cerulean blue. One of them w uh, was uh, international, what we call today international orange. So that had a sort of little test. It was there uh, in, in a small way. Uh, but it was the color of the primer, uh, the primer that once the bridge structure was there, it was the color of the primer and they painted it while they were deciding what to do. The War Department was very interested in having a dark surface with maybe yellow stripes or yellow with black stripes so that airplanes coming in or ships coming in from offshore could see the bridge. And lo and behold, uh, Irving Morrow uh, was just delighted with the primer, the architect, and Benjamin Bufano, who was, an, who was a San Francisco sculptor, uh, Maynard Dixon, a very distinguished San Francisco uh, artist who does a beautiful painting of the, of the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, even before the full design was, was released, mm -hmm. they began to say, wait a minute, if it's not broke, don't fix it. That's the color. And I think that's the final design element. Uh, today we have um, the writers and the editor of Redemptive Dreams Engaging Kevin Starr's California. Uh, to speak about his work, and uh, the moderator, Julia Flynn Seiler. And so, first, uh, James Sexton, who is the editor. He works at UCLA's Institute for the, of the Environment and Sustainability. He teaches at UCLA's Sociology Department. He's authored or edited eight books and has published many articles in influential academic journals. His writing has also appeared in the Los Angeles Times, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and the San Francisco Chronicle. He was the interim California State University Associate Dean of Academic Programs and a visiting fellow at UC Berkeley's Center for the Study of Religion and at the Center for the Study of Law and Society. That'll give you a little bit of idea of why he takes the angle he takes on this. <laughs> and um, one of the contributors, uh, Russell Jung, is Professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University. He is a co-founder of Stop AAPI Hate, 
and is the author of several books on race and religion, including Family Sacrifices, The World Views and Ethics of Chinese Americans. Pre Professor Jung was named one of the Times 100 Most Influential Persons, as well as being selected for the Bloomberg 50 and the Political 40 Most Impactful Persons for his Stop AAPI Hate Work during the COVID pandemic. I'm sure you all remember that coming out. Thank you for that, that work. That was absolutely needed. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, Peter Richardson, another contributor, has written several critically acclaimed books, including about Hunter Thompson and the Grateful Dead. Kevin would love to be in that company. Um, his essays have been published in The Nation, The New Republic, The Los Angeles Review of Books, and The San Francisco Chronicle. Mr. Richardson received the National Entertainment Journalism Award for online criticism in 2013 for his book reviews. Previously, he was a book editor at the University of California Press, the Public Policy Institute of California, and Harper and Row Publishers. And Julia Flynn Seiler, our moderator, is an award-winning author and journalist for the Wall Street Journal and Business Week magazine. Her most recent book, The White Devil's Daughters, The Women Who Fought Slavery in San Francisco's Chinatown, was a New York Times Book Review editor's choice and a finalist for a California Book, Rewar a book Award. Her June 2004 front page story for the Wall Street Journal about the turmoil within the Mondavi family's wine empire led to her book, The House of Mondavi, a finalist both for a James Beard Award and a Gerald Loeb Award for Distinguished Reporting, which is now in its 12th printing. I think a lot of us will remember when that book came out. That was a real big, interesting thing for the Bay Area, you know, in, in, in our wine business. So that's your panel. Julia, enjoy while I fall off stage. Don't fall off, George. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And wasn't that something to see, uh, to see the wonderful Kevin it remind us that it was actually the primer that we see on the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm -hmm. That's the color. So I, who knew? And it came out of the Panama Pacific um, exposition. Anyways, uh, so I'm here, as you know, with uh, Russell and Jason Sexton and Peter, and we're going to discuss uh, this new wonderful book. I found it so eye-opening, Redemptive Dreams, Engaging Kevin Starr's California. Um, and, you know, just a little bit of uh, personal background. He was, Kevin was such a wonderful storyteller, and I, a very generous person, and I had the good fortune to meet him for the first time, and I think Sheila at the same time at a picnic uh, amidst the redwoods. And um, I'm very grateful to him. Uh, he passed away more than six years ago, and that really leads me to the first question. And let's start with you, Jason, since you edited this wonderful book. Um, why is Kevin's legacy important to look at today? Why are we looking at it today? I mean, nobody has, has given us more uh, literarily than Kevin Starr engaging California. Right, he's, I mean, nobody's going to turn to Kevin Starr and ask, what have you done for us lately? I mean, he's, he's, he's done it. <laughs> he wrote eight volumes. Eight volumes, uh, as well as, I mean, you, when you look at the bibliography uh, here, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, these are the popular books that were selling well. But he did a lot more than just what everybody knew. He, he sort of wrote local histories. He, he wrote um, dozens and dozens of articles uh, engaging the Catholic history of San Francisco and throughout the state. Um, and so there's a lot more of Kevin sort of underneath what, what we know sort of in that, um, you know, popular uh, shape of his, of, his, of his work. And I think, you know, as I'm a theologian and sort of have, have come to really try to, try to take California seriously as a place. And when I came around to doing this, it was sort of like, who is here? Well, you can't really study California without going through Kevin Starr. Right, so that, that began the conversation, and, and, you know, and it started with a phone call. It started with a phone call, it was a very personal uh, moment when, when there were some sociologists and historians coming together to, to sort of take California uh, seriously in an interdisciplinary fashion, and I remember calling Kevin on the phone. I thought, well, you know, could, could we get Kevin to come to a small event that we were, we were having, and he picks up the phone. Uh, after I think I tried about a dozen times to catch him on the phone, he picks up the phone. I said, There's no way, but he picks up the phone. And I'm in Cambridge in the UK, and, 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 and so, 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 you know, you, you don't know who I am, but I grew up in Tracy over the Altamont Pass. And he says, oh, I, I know the <laughs> Tracy town. And I said, but I'm at Ridley Hall, Cambridge. And he says, Ridley, the bishop. Now, that's not Kevin's 
Catholic tradition, but that's, that's an Anglican tradition in a place where I was in, in Cambridge in the UK. And his grasp of theology, tradition, to sort of locate right, what this phenomena of California was, just so fascinating. And, and he gave us time, a lot of time, and, and really connected uh, in such a way that, that brought me into at least imagining that, that there was a lot here. Uh, and, and you know we've barely even, with this book, I think, begun to just scratch the surface of what Kevin Starr was up to. Mm, I, I love that. So I'm going to go one by one. We'll start that way. And then I hope, you know, we'll turn it into a conversation. Um, and we'll kick it off, though, with a couple of uh, specific questions. Russell, we've talked um, a little bit, or Jason just mentioned, the theological lens that Kevin brought to his history of the state. And specifically, Kevin brought a Catholic lens of, of original sin and redemption. And uh, he was adopting the perspective of his predecessor, the historian Josiah Royce. Um, how would you have liked Kevin to look at the stories of Native Americans, of blacks, of Latinos, um, if, if Kevin were still with us, how would you have liked? Because certainly in your department is um, ethnic studies, and there's been a lot of uh, focus, particularly on bringing forward uh, those voices instead. So, Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when I've learned about Kevin Starr and when Jason asked us to come and look at Kevin's work through a theological lens, through his Catholic perspective, we saw a lot of, um, and he wrote about um, California's original sin as, as um, raping the land during the gold mining times, the um, genocide of the indigenous people. And if that was the start, if that was the foundation of California, how do we redeem California? It's sort of, just as he wrote about California being um, part of the American story, how do we redeem slavery and the genocide of people? And for us in ethnic studies, that's a continuing issue with mass incarceration, with anti-Asian hate. How do we redeem this state um, given its, its ruptures, given its evils? And I think that's what we really wrestle with a lot throughout this anthology is what is there to be saved? What good can we redeem from California? It's you know nature, it, our technological advances. And I think... Um, especially what narratives do we need to redeem about America and about California um, that we need to develop. So for me, as an ethnic studies scholar, I think Kevin did a great job telling the story of California. And <laughs> there's this word that I kept on bumping against. Like, people called him polymathic and Baroque. And I had no idea what these meant, and I had to look it up. Because Kevin, you know, like, as you saw in the clip, he knew so much about so many different areas about the environment, about banking, about you know, geography, about ethnic studies, that um, from what he also acknowledged, though, is, is what we want in ethnic studies is to be able to tell the story of California from our own perspectives, from our particu mm. particular fragmentary positionalities, mm. knowing that we don't have the complete story, but we need it to be added to the story, mm. that we need it to be included in the story. So I think what I would have liked um, for us to continue Kevin's legacy is to continue to tell those stories and to do it with, with gusto, to do it with um, a profound sense that we have something to say and we, we can create our own story um, in spite of what we need to redeem. Oh, that's beautifully put. And he, Kevin himself talked a lot about writing history as through the glass darkly to, mm -hmm. to uh, Jason, he did talk about that quite a bit, about the fragmentary nature of how little we can see, in a sense. And drawing from St. Paul in the New Testament, and Saint sort Paul. of, you know, we see through the glass, just sort of darkly. Of course, and in, in would sometimes play in his literature that, that, of course, this is California, so there's a juxtaposition there, and yet, and yet would continually find himself drawing back from the, the struggle of, of what it is to, to, um, to be alive here. Fragmentary. Yes. So, Peter, let's turn to you. We're not going to talk theology right now with you. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, that's a relief. <laughs> that's a relief. So, some historians have found Kevin's narrative approach frustrating 
you know, with his generalizations and his lack of source citation. But it's helpful, as, as Jason, you pointed out, and, and so did you, Russell, that um, he, his literary output was enormous and spanned journalism as well and cultural commentary. And there was a long period, as you write, Peter, that between 1976 and 1983, he was a columnist for the San Francisco Examiner. And that was the time when he displayed his, you know, unusual gift for synthesis. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and he was working, as I say, as a journalist rather than a historian. Could you talk a little bit about those examiner columns and what they tell us about Kevin as a cultural commentator rather than as a historian? Sure, sure. Yeah, I just, can I add something to sure, what Jason of said too? What, what I would add is that um, Kevin sponsored a lot of work. You know, he, he, his own work was incredible, but the amount of work that he sponsored and encouraged was, was um, you know, any, anybody who, who, who ever asked him for that kind of favor um, usually got what they were asking for. You know, uh, the blurb or the, the review or the introduction or, or whatever okay, it was. Full disclosure, he blurred blur my book, so. <laughs> Mine too. But even before that, um, I, I had decided to write over here when I was working at the Public Policy Institute of California as an editor, I decided to write um, a biography of, of Kerry McWilliams, who was one of his uh, favorite California writers. And um, I just sent him the proposal, blind. He didn't know me. You know, there was no connection at all. And I went away. I guess I went to lunch or something. I came back and... Uh, there was a uh, you know a message on my phone. Remember those, and um, you know this is Kevin Starr. You know I sent your I love your proposal. I sent it to Jim Clark at the University of California Press. You know, I mean really, it was like a fantasy. You know that that <laughs> somebody would would take the interest and also pick up the phone and talk to the exact right person about it. You know it was just incredible. So I don't know how many people he did that for, but I think legions. You know, people, and, um, and including you, it sounds like Julie. So my interest in in and my contribution to to this um, volume was that um, I was online, and and um, somebody said, "Does anybody know why Harvey Milk referred to Kevin Starr so scathingly in his most famous speech?" And nobody knew. Like the hive mind didn't know. That's weird. It was Gustavo Ariano of the Los Angeles Times. I, his followers, you, you might expect to know something like about that and I couldn't find anything so and the other question I had was why he didn't write about um, the 60s 70s and, and part of the 80s in his this magisterial California dreams you know his, his masterpiece really was this series of books and uh, and then I also wondered where those two things related did he not write about that period in part because of um, the kinds of figures that he had written about at the San Francisco Examiner, when he wrote six columns a week for seven years. So he, it wasn't that he didn't write about this period. He wrote a lot about this period. We know what he thought about it. But, um, but he chose not to include it in this, in this book series. So that, that was the, mm -hmm. that was the, those were the questions that drew me into this. It was also very hard to find the columns. I guess you could have gone through the microfiche old, you know, old school, right? Um, I wasn't that interested in that. But what I what I did follow up on was um, the California State Library, Kevin's collection at the California State Library, where he has all of his San Francisco Examiner columns still unprocessed and therefore hard to find, I mean, hard to access. So I spent a lot of time up there reading these, these columns. And what I found was, you know, first of all, he's putting out, what is that, 700 words six days a week. You know, the Saturday column was on religion. And, you know, the one figure after another, public figure, very public spirited. And, um, mm. you know, and talking about all the personalities and trends and, and politics, you know, of the time. And also he, he took the opportunity to kind of present himself. It wasn't his primary focus at all. But every once in a while, you know, he would, he would, he would let you know a little something about where he was. And I would just, to, to, you know, quick version is he sort of presented himself as a kind of California version of um, a Catholic conservative intellectual, like a little bit like William F. Buckley, who he did write about um, in the in the Examiner. And so, uh, and it was a Hearst paper, 
you know, so you, you have to consider the whole context of his audience, what he's expected to produce, and what his readers are going to respond to. And, you know, um, not all of it was super timely and doesn't, it doesn't all hold up very well. Most journalism, much journalism doesn't. But, um, but for me, it was so important to try to understand his evolution, his literary formation, mm. and then his evolution as a writer. Because after he quit writing for the, for the examiner, he ran for supervisor unsuccessfully. And only then did he return to this great series that is his masterpiece. So the second volume kind of came out after that. Now he was teaching at USF. He was, he was writing, he had written speeches for Mayor Aliotto. He had a communications business. But um, it was only then that he began to sort of take on the, the um, literary persona of the California Chronicler. Mm. You know, that came after all of these other experiences. So I hope that my contribution sort of helped us kind of establish that, the baseline for that evolution, his evolution as a writer. And then, you know, as he becomes, he takes on a kind of academic persona, and, um, and it's much less partisan. Um, you know, the moral judgments are fewer. Uh, and, um, you know, so, so he, you know, the persona that he, that he builds and consolidates mm -hmm. is really the one that most people know. But, um, you know, there was this earlier chapter that was a kind of step along the way, much, I think, as, as graduate studies at Harvard were. You know, so there was this kind of melding and evolution that I wanted to make sure I emphasized. Mm-hmm. Any big surprises? Any columns that you went, oh? Yeah, yeah, there were. I mean, and, and, and a lot of it had to do with the, the question that Gustavo Arellano wrote about, like, what was it that Harvey Milk was responding to? And you could find those columns, you know. They were not especially generous to the gay community in the Castro at that time. And he also wrote favorably about Dan White, you know. And, um, you know, not after, of course, the, the, the assassinations. But um, he, did write, he did identify with the San Francisco Police Department during the, the um, White Night Riots, which I think tells you a little bit about, you know, who, who, who he identified with and who he was writing for. Yeah. Well, that really leads me to my next question, which is, Jason, you know, I, one of the big surprises for me in this collection was to learn about Kevin's very impoverished childhood and his background. And I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit and, and how his growing up in San Francisco and the way that he grew up and his Catholic upbringing then informed his work going forward. And not everybody will know this, so. Right, it's certainly a, a, a feature, a significant feature under, underneath uh, this project, um, Kevin's biography. Um, and it's a, it's a very human experience, right, to be uh, raised by in, in an orphanage uh, and then come back to the city of San Francisco um, to then get a scholarship to USF and, and, and so constantly um, and, and, and what I noticed in, in interacting with, with Kevin um, and who's so gracious, um, perhaps you know I mean, blurbing your book, which I'm sure deserved it, um, you know, but so gracious to folks like me who probably didn't deserve it uh, as <laughs> much as others. Uh, Kevin, Kevin really you know he's just such a hopeful figure um, and and I think that emphasizes, you know, what you see as he was working through these institutions, uh, off to the military, then a degree at Harvard, and working in the mayor's office back in San Francisco, and and finding his way as a, you know, as as, as a writer. Um, you know, I think I think a lot of this uh, really is 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 him. His his biography is is narrating a lot of his. Uh, what he's writing about this place and, and, and the experience of California that he talks about in the first chapter mm -hmm. of, of this book. And, and it's interesting how he, he is, um, I suppose, in, in um, well, at least in the university today, right? I mean, we're critical of, of everything. And yet Kevin, I, you know, I think there is a critical dimension of Kevin. I think there's, um, you know, he's, he's drawing from his own Catholic tradition as he's 
sort of seeing what's changes that are happening, um, and some that he struggled to incorporate. And yet, and yet, what often uh, one of the things Peter didn't mention was that how uh, after the the uh, in in the Peter's chapter uh, he has the engagement with Harvey Milk, and, and you have the assassination. And then just a couple years later, he's, he's celebrating the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence as they're coming through San Francisco in back-to-back -back columns in, in the Examiner. Mm -hmm. and, and yet was also still aware of who he was, I think. I think he was aware that he, um, remember in uh, the San Francisco Chronicle, there was a critical piece that I had come across uh, about sort of Kevin in the mayor's office seeking a sabbatical so he can finish the second volume. And, 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 and it's really trying to chronicle this, right, right, sort of trying to hold on to a California that he knew that had, that had, uh, that he had where he had experienced life in, in, through the midst of all the struggles, which, which included church. That wasn't um, uncomplicated. Right? In his last two volumes, he comes back to really try to account for scandals in the Catholic Church. And, and yet, as a Catholic, he's sort of um, what uh, theologian Catherine Keller calls sort of staying with the trouble, right? staying with, 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 with this. And, and, and I remember him saying, you know, the, the, the sisters that raised him, he didn't, you know, he was, he was so grateful uh, for, for his uh, experience and yet recognized that there were uh, that there were, there were problems. So I think, I think you know, his, his, he, he is in a way doing what some uh, religion scholars call uh, theology through biography. Uh, and and, and that, is, that is something that also uh, Mike Davis, in, incidentally, in his final chapter, picks up and, and, and says at, at different points, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't really understand Kevin's biography. Hmm. You know, how he sort of weaves through things and, and connects uh, things that you wouldn't think go together. Right, in these fusionist ways that, that give us a real hopeful vision of, of California and, and of humanity. Well, your volume really, or this book really reminded me, you know, he was a product of the 50s, of much more optimistic time. And he, in some ways, navigated through the decades and changed his mind on issues, as you noted, you know, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Yeah, yes, can I Russell? ask a question about that? Sure, yeah. Because you wrote about his period when he was writing for the Examiner and then running for office. And I think there he is writing to a particular audience and, and exploring his own politics. Whereas when he was historian and writing the volumes about California, he was trying to write as a historian to a different audience, synthesizing a little bit more of the California story mm -hmm. rather than his personal story, right? Or his personal politics. So I was wondering if you saw in his Examiner stories any evidence of his California historian perspective, and if he saw in his California history volumes somewhat of his politics that he wrote in the examiner, like, or was it just a change in time? Like, did he just shift? Mm. So was he really shifting his perspective, or they were just writing to different audiences, um, different platforms, and trying to, yeah. yeah. I think he. Um, I think the thing that that stays the same, that remains constant, is that he put civic culture above um, the conflicts, you know, and and the conflicts tended to be, you know, um, the 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 basic stuff of 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 urban politics, and he's always looking for some hmm. something a little bit, something that kind of transcended that a little bit. Hmm. And um, he came in seventh. You know, there were six open, open seats. It wasn't a winning message. Or a supervisor seat he ran yeah, for. Yeah, sorry, on yeah. On a conservative platform. Right. And this was, was in the 70s, right? 70s right, 70s. right, and he sort of said, we need to put aside our sort of identity differences. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have said it that way. But to, and, mm -hmm. and think about what's right for the city and county. And um, he did that for California, too. That was his message to gov the new governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And Schwarzenegger liked it. He, Schwarzenegger sent it out to all of his staff. That's what he, he was trying to do as governor at the same time. That the, Sorry, the so he was saying set aside identity politics? Was set aside partisanship. Partisanship. Yeah, I think is what, what um, Schwarzenegger had in mind. And he, he was trying to build those bridges in a way at that time. And of course... You know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that in Schwarzenegger's case. I mean, he never won a primary in his own party. You know, that makes a big difference. 
but um, and, and became the two-time governor. But I do think that that's the one constant is that there was this, and and that's why he could connect with somebody like Mike Davis, whose politics were very mm -hmm. different from his own, because he would encourage something a little broader-minded and something a little bit, you know, um, more broadly, generous. Broadly Catholic. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Great point, um, Russell. The the title redemptive dreams of this book speaks to Kevin's theological and hor historical understanding of California but I wanted to ask you the question okay you gave me this question but it's a great one <laughs> what, what do you see our state needing redemption from and redeemed towards what well one of the things I well there's lots of things we need to be redeemed from um, and I think right now what we see is the growing polarization and inequality in our state that I think Kevin would address. Like um, we were just talking about, he was seeking a higher provincialism, something that would draw us beyond our sectarian perspectives, our identity politics, our own personal self-interest, to be loyal to one another for the common good. And I think um, we need to be redeemed from our self-interested perspectives. I see as we, you know, he'd be concerned about the climate crisis of our consumerism and how we exploit the land. He'd be concerned about continuing race, racial problems. Um, he, I would think to redeem mass incarceration, to redeem slavery, he would, we would need to consider reparations in our state. And I think, um, you know, there's new issues that he wouldn't even have imagined, like AI, which would, again, increase... Um, the inequality in our state. and um, So I think AI, the climate crisis, the racial and political and religious polarization now, I think all those issues still need to be redeemed. I'd like to hear what others would say. Um, and wrestling, how do we come up with a higher provincialism? How do we have an understanding beyond our own um, particular interests to come together f for the common good? I think you know, like that's why he didn't win the election is because he sought a higher provincialism. And I think sort of the structure of our government, our elections is that, and, and now, especially in social media, the algorithms aren't organized so that we can think of a common good um, together and, and work towards it. Yeah. Would either of you like to take a crack at that, that question? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very democratic vision that Kevin's got, and, and it is coming from sort of, you know, pro progressive history of, of, you know, of California that he saw as, um, as possible, you know, with hold, holding out all sorts of possible. Not that he wasn't critical of, you know, different moments, and, and, and it's interesting, when I, when I sort of read the history of, of, of Kevin, I, I do think there is, at least from the early volume, which I've taught to students in the State University, and, and, and some students you know, did see some of the early Kevin as, as uh, I mean, he's reading the literature and he's sort of telling what he sees, but he, he sort of sharpens his gaze, I think, as, as he goes and through the experience. So you don't get a lot of, I mean, he's often said, well, folks, folks would criticize him for being thin on theory. And yet, I think the theory is our book tries to um, uh, un, you know, really showcase, uh, you know, is that he was a Catholic historian. You know, the entire time. And, and yet, this was a moment in the 80s and 90s when he gets hired at University of Southern California where um, the critical historical school is sort of changing. There's, you know, Kevin's drawing from narrative. He is drawing from his experience. He's keeping it a bit quiet, right? And, and he's not alone in this. I think historians from this generation at Stanford, for example, Al Camarillo, who we're on a panel with in a couple weeks, um, uh, have also, you know, a Catholic historian who also says, you know, sort of what's the role of thinking from within these traditions? Well, you just can't do it. And so Kevin was in this, you know, difficult space in the university, right, thinking critically about both his own positionality, although he wouldn't say, I don't think, no, that term's probably not anywhere in his writing, uh, and, and yet is, is sort of precipitating, I think, um, you know, kind of narratives that you get, as we argue, um, in, in ethnic studies, right, sort of drawing from, he would call, we would refer to this as a usable past, for the sake of, of navigating a future, right, and a future that's, that's one that is fusionist, uh, so you may take some losses, these might, might not be your uh, best values, but at least we're going to do this together, right, we're going to do this together and sort of and, and, and so in that sense, I think 
uh, you know, I mean, the, the people who Kevin disagreed with on issues, you know, he would still maintain friendships with. I think that's one of the beautiful things about what Kevin uh, is, is offering as, as he was continuing to, you know, to, to sharpen his gaze and his critique. And then what's interesting to me is, is what he does in the final two volumes, which are not part of the California dream, but then he sort of comes back to his own tradition. So tell us a little bit about what he did in those last two volumes. Well, it, I, I mean, it, it is, um, it is, it, um, he, he, I mean, he didn't complete them. There was meant to be four, mm -hmm. four volumes. Uh, but it was, it was the effort to sort of come back to say, uh, I, I think, um, you know, drawing from Josiah Royce in, in the back, there is something about uh, what's true that's sort of the source of everything, uh, and also a pursuit, right? Truth as both a source and a pursuit. Um, and he found, he found truth in his tradition. Now, I'm not a Catholic, huh? um, uh, but he found that this was a tradition uh, that not only was he embedded in, but it was worth uh, not, not just critiquing, but also caretaking. And so really, I mean, Kevin didn't do anything small. Right? So it was, it was the whole history of Roman Catholicism in the Americas right, that he really wanted to account for. Uh, and I think he did a hell of a job really running through um, so the early values of the Jesuits and sort of what happened with the Iroquois and, and really was, was trying to sort of do it all together, of course, with, uh, with Sheila's help. Uh, I mean, none of, none of Kevin's words got put out without Sheila's uh, help at every point right there. And this volume is dedicated to Sheila. Of course. Yes. Um, of course. Yeah. Peter, how about you? Would you take a crack at, you know, how, what, what, what do you see our uh, state is needing redemption from? And how do uh, we get there? I agree with many of the, many of the things that Rus Russell mentioned. Um, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't consider myself an expert on that. I mean, one thing that, um, it, that Kevin might say is, I mean, you, when you think about this metaphor that organizes this whole series of the California dream, you know, and he, he lost faith in it, I think, for a short time himself mm. um, in mm. the early 2000s when yeah. there was some talk about California as a failed state. And, but there was also that kind of durable optimism, I think, that kind of, mm. you know, there was a kind of resurgence of that. And I think um, that would be a nice thing to see more of. You know, not, not necessarily utopianism, you know, but a, a certain kind of optimism um, that we can that we can meet our challenges successfully uh, if we work together, as that would be his mm -hmm. addendum, I think, in every case. But um, so aside from specific issues, I think there was this, this idea that, you know, you have the, that's part, part of what we need to do in our public life is um, exercise our imaginative faculty, <laughs> you know, like mm. dream it. Yeah. You know, and um, I'm not, you know, I th I, we, we still do a fair amount of that, but there, I think, is a, a, a little bit more, um, you know, skepticism or cynicism about what we can actually accomplish together that I don't think Kevin shared. Yeah, yeah. So this might be a good time to go into Mike Davis, who was kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum in some ways as, as Kevin, but they were friends and they had a lot of respect for each other. And um, Jason, the, the, the book often discusses kind of st Kevin's redemptive perspective versus uh, Mike Davis's darker one uh, about the state. And uh, Redemp Redemptive Dreams ends with your wonderful conversation with Mike while he was in palliative care about Kevin. It's very, very touching, that last chapter. At least I found it so. so how do you relate to their two views of California's futures, with Kevin's being generally more optimistic and Mike's being so noirish, essentially? Yeah, it seems to me that Mike starts with the critique. Um, and Kevin, uh, you know, it, 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 um, sort of thinking out loud here, Kevin, Kevin starts from his 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 place. Uh, you know, it, I mean, they are also geographically juxtaposed. Mike, you know, being Inland Empire and, and Los Angeles, and of course, well, San San Diego most of his life, and 
both upbringing and, and, and later. Um, and yet they sort of both do kind of merge. So you have the, the you know, so, sort of a hopeful, vi I think both of them are hopeful, really. Um, and maybe Kevin, you know, is, is uh, unwilling to uh, grapple. And Mike talks about this in his, his chapter that Kevin, you know, sort of has a perspective of the 60s, sort of like uh, you know, just a revulsion. I mean, very difficult, uh, sort of like Joan Didion's, you know, you just can't take it. So you, you leave the state. Of course, Steph Kevin stayed here. But, but Kevin's feet were always planted here. In Northern California, and specifically in San Francisco. San Francisco. Yeah. In San Francisco, except for a few years. Uh, and so the, the, you know, the, the one, whereas Mike, you know, and talks in the chapter how he, he envied Kevin, uh, he, he wishes he would have lived in Northern Cal <laughs> California and, and had a, a small stint where he, he stayed in a, a laundromat for a couple of days in Berkeley. It was <laughs> nice and warm. <laughs> I liked his memory of that. <laughs> You know, and, and, and was always sort of a radical organizer, and, and, and was, um, and yet what, what, what c connects the both of them, and I think uh, Mike says in his chapter that when he, the debate was set up between him and, and Kevin, he thought it would have been a, a squabble that they would have had at the, uh, this, this event in Los Angeles, and, and yet um, he found so much that Kevin had to say agreeable and interesting. Um, and, and, and the friendship began. He also notes how, how he thought that Kevin was this representative of the elite class, and yet he realized he was shanty Irish to the core. Mm -hmm. Raised um, in an orphanage, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, you know, I, I think what, what's very interesting is, is incredibly similar uh, backgrounds from Irish, Irish working class, um, poor. And so, so from those... You know, and, and, you know, where you get the humanity, uh, you know, with, with them too, I, th I think is, is really where, it's sort of a beautiful uh, way that this volume, I mean, it starts with Kevin, right? Sort of how do you interpret California going forward? And he says a lot of interesting things about, you know, how we ought to look at California and trust California. And, and I think Mike uh, comes similar to, you know, is of course the late Mike Davis having died just last, uh, last October. Um, uh, you know, noting uh, that, that Kevin's, uh, you know, Kevin's, Kevin's vision uh, was one that he, he um, shared so much uh, with, this, this hopeful vision, especially with uh, a commitment to workers, a commitment to uh, the working class uh, and, and protections and, and, and um, this emphasis on, on us together as a collective uh, moving forward. We've lost two greats. And, and they were book, yeah. bookended mm -hmm. by these two great historians. Um, Mike Davis was the historian of city courts and a great chronicler of Southern California, particularly. Um, I really enjoyed that. The other, the other part of the essay, I wish they were here to speak to it directly, was the essay in the collection by Sid Martinez and Thomas Ehrlich Reichler, uh, whose title is This Could Be Heaven or Hell, which is drawn from a, um, the lyrics of the 1970s hit Hotel California. I think all of us grew up with that. Uh, and I, I love that um, essay in the way that it weaves the weaves in the black science fiction writer Octavia Butler's very dystopian vision and 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 very futuristic and and you know right on target vision of where the state was going mm -hmm. and where the country was going um, and and connected that to Kevin's legacy as well so I I thought that was a wonderful. Um, surprising essay and I very much enjoyed it and I just thought I'd toss this out to you are there any cultural commentators Russell or historians that we should be reading right now Who, who's going to step into these great historians of the of the states shoes who should we be paying attention to yeah that's a great question you know so he yeah um these authors did refer to Octavia Butler and saying that we need these alternative futurists mm -hmm to engage our social imagination, to think otherwise and to think differently from what we're trapped in. Yep. And so I think, um, you know, if we were talking about um, Kevin Starr or, you know, Mike Davis, it's an either or hopeful or noirish perspective of California. I think it's always both and. Mm -hmm. And I think um, these alternative future writers, I can't think of any right now, but um, who provide us a more, a more holistic vision is what we need. Um, I think mm -hmm. 
you know, throughout this book, it's a lot about, um, yeah, sin or redemption. You know, are we, um, is California going down or is there any hope for the state? And I think um, we need a large enough vision that can embrace both, you know, Kevin Starr and Mike Davis in, in understanding. The thing that I think that brought them together and I think that the futurist hope that we could have is that they ended on social movements and the last chapter is on the movement of people coming together and it's again the mm-hmm. same theme mm-hmm. of can we come together as a broad movement to make our future different and so we need both those who could imagine a different future the authors, the writers we need the organizers and then we need um, the resources so um, mm-hmm. I'll, keep on th- I'll think about it a while. you're thinking of um the book that Mike did with um, mm-hmm. John Wiener, Set the Night on Fire, which was about the 60s, mm-hmm. which Kevin declined to write about in, in, in his series, but did write a lot about in his examiner columns. Um, the thing I think of with, with Mike is that, and what I got out of this, this last chapter, which Jason deserves a lot of credit for, Mike was not feeling well, and it was, it was, it, it was heroic of him, really, to work with you, Jason, I think, on that. And what what delighted me was that Kevin charmed Mike Davis. You know, that was personal charm that I that I was sensing between the lines. Not even between the lines. It seemed pretty explicit that Kevin was was you know Kevin invited Mike Davis to the Bohemian Grove. You know, <laughs> and Mike thought about it. You know, and and only declined when he learned that he couldn't write about it later. So. Um, well, there was a nice teasing between them, too, wasn't yes, there? Mike Davis yeah. saying, what am I going to do? You know, drink wine and pee against the redwood trees or something. Oh, and then, like uh, then Kevin came up with an impromptu rap all of a sudden in <laughs> yeah. some sort of public forum that also delighted Mike. So, and, the, and finally, and maybe a little more intellectual thing, is they both love Carrie McWilliams. And, you know, Mike thought that it was, it was Kevin's research on the 30s and reading McWilliams that was the change in, in, his, um, in his self-presentation over time. That, that is, as Jason said, he was thinking about the past differently in the middle of his series, and especially when he got to the 30s. I, I, can't, I can't say one way or the other. I mean, I took, the, I took the, the opposite route by thinking of him as an author and thinking about his literary formation and his persona. And, and, and that was what I was trained to do. You know, my, my um, training is in English. So, um, but the fact that they were both drawn to Carrie McWilliams, whom um, Mike called, what did he call him, a one-man think tank for the California left. Okay, that is not a description of Kevin, I think, in, 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 under any, you know, circumstance. But... Um, they were both drawn to him and his example, and um, and that comes through very clearly in both Kevin's work and Mike's. Who should we be reading now, Peter? Oh, I thought you, you know. Oh, I you knew snout. I was going to ask you that question. I was question. trying to get away. I, I have my Russell. snout so firmly <laughs> right now in the, in the 60s and 70s because I'm writing about the first decade of Rolling Stone magazine that I'm I'm falling behind really in in. Uh, um, my reading about California, especially contemporary California. So I'm going to have to toss it back. Julie, you probably have the best answer. Oh, boy. I, you know, I'd have to give that a lot of thought. I mean, the one thing that comes to mind is there's such amazing YA work going yeah, on right all, now. Yeah, uh-huh. Futurist oh. YA work in the, in the state. Um, so I don't know. I'd have to give it more thought. But, uh, YA young adult? Young adult yeah. work. It's right. not historical, but it's a certainly cultural commentary, and sometimes it's a lot more uh, insightful uh, uh, and, 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 and right on target. Um, so, and I, super popular. I mean, if you go down to the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books oh, yeah. and look at the attendance for the YA stuff, it's, yeah. and it's, adults very, are, it's actually very yeah. humbling. You know, for, <laughs> for people like us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I want to. I, I wonder if I can get a, a, yes, sh- a shout out for a colleague, um, Kyle May's book, um, Beacon Press, uh, an Afro-Indigenous history uh, of of the United States. And Kyle uh, writes this beautiful uh, narrative. I mean, he's a colleague at UCLA, but uh, writes this just gorgeous um, account of. Uh, you know, it's often said among uh, you know critical historians that yeah, I mean you either 
especially for those from black studies or from native Indian studies, you, you be one or the other. And Kyle says, well, actually, ethnically, I'm both. And so pulls it together academically as this, this history um, that's, that's a complicated and, and yet beautiful uh, account. And I think, in a way, um, uh, sort of does what Kevin was, was, was doing and precipitating is this fusionist history, mm-hmm. right? That, that here, here are these, these unlikely narratives, and, and, and especially amidst the, the sins of the past that we, we certainly can't ignore, but need to look at head on and account for. Uh, and as we come together, you know, we can, through this, find some, some, ways, some ways forward and a beauty in the ashes. Yeah, I, I could actually. Um, so yeah. I just taught this grad class, and Claire Jean Kim wrote this book, Asians in an Anti-Black World. And it is, again, um, a, a Californian book because California's demographics has changed. You know, Kevin referred to California as an Asian place. And it's, you think of, American assimilation as being um, Asian immigrants entering or Latino immigrants entering and seeking white adjacency or gaining white status and privilege. Um, but what she writes about is how that, that pursuit of the American dream leads to anti-blackness. And she writes particularly about how Asians now as new immigrants are, are um, adopting anti-black positionality in order to get ahead. and. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great cultural commentary and a, a real good critique of, of the Asian American community of how American society is structured such that the only way we can get ahead is to be anti-black. And so I thought, um, it's, I've been wrestling with it a lot. And I think, you know, it's not just Asians then who are trying to get ahead by being anti-black. It's American society trying to, you know, foundationally get ahead by being anti-black. Well, and Russell, let's circle back to Kevin's statement that California could be looked at as an Asian place. What do you think he meant by that? Well, there's lots of ways California is an Asian place. Yeah. I mean, it's, hmm. its economy was built by Asian labor. Its government was funded by Asian and foreign minor taxes in the 19th century. You know, it was built by Asians. Um, its psychology is very Zen-like. Um, even now, Silicon Valley, how they get their workers to, to be more productive is to develop mindfulness practices so that they could focus and be less stressed. So I think in its psychology, in its built environment, and in its boba, um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. you can see California. Thanks for mentioning boba. Yeah, I have to <laughs> the, you took me to the boba. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I um, yeah, Kevin talked about it as an Asian place, and I think, mm. again, it's, it's a fragmentary perspective of <clears throat> so much of our state has been shaped by Asians, and mm. yet we've been, but also shaped in that we've been excluding, we as California have sought to exclude Asians throughout our history. Oh. And our own self-identity is in contrast to what we are trying to exclude, right? And so I think our self-understanding is set against Asians as the alien. So in both ways, um, California set against Asians and California being built by Asians. In both of those ways, California is an Asian place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's just about that time. Any, any last thoughts, Boba? Uh, <laughs> well, color of the gold. I mean, this, is, this is an important. You know, Kevin is as the ever learner, right? Yeah. And I think he talks about this in his first chapter. You know, you sort of is that what broke means? In, in I didn't quite understand what broke me, it meant. Polymathic, I could get, but what did he? What is it meant when people describe him as being baroque or his process as being baroque? Anyone want to tackle that question, Jason? <laughs> well, I think it was uh, actually it was Forrest Robinson, I think, who mm-hmm. described him. Who described him that way, right? From UC Santa Cruz, and it was a defense against the charge, real, really, that Mike Davis had made that oh. that Kevin's history was a kind of Whig history, mm-hmm. and Forrest Robinson said it's really more Baroque than that, but uh, <laughs> you know, he didn't really div- he didn't linger on the point okay. for very long. So. <laughs> We'll leave it at there, but I think it's time for questions, and I hope we have some good ones. We have a couple from online that I can ask. Uh, maybe the Baroque meant uh, sort of an over-decorated Catholic cathedral, you know, something like that. Maybe that. Um, so 
Uh, we have some questions online. If anybody has anything here, uh, just let us know. Um, and if you've written it out on a card, that's fine. If you'd like to ask it in person, I'll come right to you. So um, one uh, listener read, uh, wrote, I have read several volumes of The California Dream. I waited for a volume in the 1970s that never came. <laughs> Why did he avoid that era? Now, you have talked about this already, but, but uh, we kind of skipped over it a little bit. So did he have particular reasons, that, things he did not want to write about? Or well, his, his first move was to, to make a joke about it and, and say that if the volume came out, it would be called Smoking the Dream. <laughs> you know, and that, and it then is. if somebody actually sort of persisted and tried to get a, a serious response, he just, he basically said, I'm not, I'm paraphrasing, that he was just out of sympathy with many of the things that were happening during that time, that he was, that he was a creature of an earlier period, really. And, mm -hmm. you know, to me, that wasn't com completely... Um, it didn't settle it, the question for me because historians always write about periods that they weren't personally shaped by or maybe didn't even personally um, you know, have a deep reverence for. Um, and the fact that it, was, that it was a very eventful period in the middle of this larger series, I think, kept it an open question for me. And, and I, think, I do think it has something to do with the... I, I don't know how many words it, it came out to be. I think I did a kind of back of the envelope calculation. He might have written a million words for the examiner, mm -hmm. something like that, yeah. over a seven-year period. And so, um, so that's where I think the answer, you know, we, we should look for the answer in, in, in those words that he wrote. But that is going to be a different Kevin than the mature Kevin. Absolutely. I mean, and you do get, I mean, you do get bits of it in the single volume, mm -hmm. uh, California History with... Um, Modern library, but um, certainly not with the, the sort of the depth of critique that he's he's giving in in the other eight volumes. But the specificity of his of you know he he didn't like the hippies, didn't like the counterculture. Said you know the human being was the was the end of them. That was their high, that was their peak moment. Mm -hmm. That everything happened. I mean you know probably a lot of people agree with that. Mm -hmm. and certainly many of his readers, I think, at, at the Examiner did. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you're just looking for the, uh, the patterns of identification and who, 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 who he, you know, sort of applauds and, and who he denounces. And I think Jason's exactly right. That changes, you know, and the tone changes, mm -hmm. too, over time. But I think you, it's helping you get at the question why he didn't write about that time. I think if he did, you know, it, it may not have come off as, as kind of as sort of... Um, you know, um, boosterish, mm -hmm. as some of the, as some of the other volumes do. I, I don't mean that the that the series is the work of a booster, mm -hmm. although that that's sometimes claimed. I, I don't see Kevin or his work that way. But um, you know, it 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 would it would be much more critical, I think, mm -hmm. of of the period if he if he did write about those decades. All right. Now here's a question, and I'm going to make a. Uh, it's a question that probably will be best answered by someone not on stage. What was Sheila's role? The editor? <laughs> researcher? Are you willing to answer directly, or do you want these scholars to say what you did? I think I was just an aide de camp. <laughs> um, I did what... Kevin did the writing uh, and the research. I slept. I, I would give etch. I'd say... This is due. You haven't done it. When are you going to get it finished? I mean, it, was, it wasn't really more than that. <laughs> That's usually the crucial role in getting a book done, though, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Um, here's one that will keep us busy for a while. Um, if you could have asked Kevin a question, what would it be? So it, all four of you can answer that question. If you, if you had a chance, if we brought Kevin back here, or you know, if we could live stream from the other side, um, <laughs> what would you ask Kevin? Uh, well, mine's related to the, the lost volume, right? Or the right. absent volume. It's, um, where do you see the California dream um, being manifest in the 60s and 70s? Mm -hmm. And um, where, what, what can we retrieve from that period that would give us hope and meaning today? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I, you know, not writing about or not having a volume of that period, which is so seminal, right, and so significant for a lot of communities of color. It's sort of interesting, you know, that gap. Um, and so as we talk about um, his politics about that time, it'd be interesting to see, you know, well, what was, um, what did he learn from it? Mm -hmm. Well, the, I mean, you know, the, the, the thing that bubbles up from, the, from the, what he did write during that period, and I, I failed to mention earlier, is that he really didn't like the Burton political machine. <laughs> you know, that was, and that came up in, mm. in, in some, some interview, an interview that he had with George Moscone. Mm. But again, it was very, you know, he brought, he, he, he asked the hard question. Moscone kind of tarried it, and it was fine. You know, let's mm. move on. And he was very critical of Jerry Brown, and he got over that. Mm. So he was very capable of, you know, of um, rising above it, you know, and, and evolving. And I think that's, that's pretty important. But if he, if, if that, those decades were not, if he, if he didn't have something to say you know, about it, I mean, then you shouldn't write a book about it. But mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that wasn't true mm -hmm. because he said a lot about it um, mm -hmm. in The Examiner. Now, I would be misleading you if I said that most of those columns were going to the hot button issues of the day. They were not. Mm -hmm. Many of them were, were very, you know, much more kind of... Um, not quotidian, but very like involved with you know civic culture. Mm -hmm. What was going on over here, or over here, or over here, and and he, he he learned to to write quickly on deadline. I think that was pretty important too. But mm -hmm. but that would be my question to Russell. I mean, as, as mm -hmm. well as the first <laughs> questioner. And Julia, how about you? Well, I would. Uh, uh, ask some variation of the same question Rus Russell asked, but of right now. Uh, mm -hmm. If, if, if okay. Kevin could look at the world we're in right now in our state and look at what's happening with AI and look at the homeless mm -hmm. encampments. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did see that, of course. It's been going on for a long time. But where's the hope? Where's the redemption? I'd like to have that. I'd like to have theological discussion, more explicit theological discussion with him about where's the redemption of the state right now? Where, where can we find it? Yeah. Well, Kevin did, I mean, I mean on this, and I, I remember asking Kevin sort of about, you know, I mean, you get what you get in the writings. Mm -hmm. I remember him talking about the town I grew up in, Tracy, as sort of the dusty town of Tracy. And any time, you know, if you want to learn anything about Ke you know, California, you just go to Kevin first and see. <laughs> so he says, McCall, calls my town the dusty town of Tracy. And I said, you call it the dusty <laughs> town of Tracy. And, he, and what was interesting is he said, actually, it's in a flood zone. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> you know, it's where the water is pumped, and so it's, yeah. it's you know sinking. You know, so he's constantly watching, and says, "Well, it's actually part of the Bay Area now." And so he's he's constantly watching this place. And I remember when COVID hit, um, and having a brief exchange with with Sheila, and I thought, "What did Kevin say about the Spanish flu?" Mm -hmm. And gosh, what is like we could we could use him now. Mm -hmm. And um, and she she had responded to me that that Kevin would. Um, you know, would have seen in this moment an important moment for uh, securing workers' uh, rights and sort of like a, you know, coming back to a place where we were as a, as a republic when unions were strong, right? And mm -hmm. so wanting to, so he's working with sort of both the political as well as, mm -hmm. as, as, as the ideal um, and sort of, and so that's I think where you find sort of a realist but also still a dreamer. Right, he's sort of living in both of these spaces, and I don't know if, and I've sort of reflected on in my chapter on you know whether, I don't know if this, if this is Baroque, uh, if this is um, you know classicist, if this is Hegelian. I think Kevin holds a lot of these things together, but al also with with this strange. I remember him saying sort of post-Augustinian Catholic, and I, and I think and Mike Mike mentions this that he did. He did believe in. I mean, I guess we could do some theological anthropology for Kevin, and um, <laughs> and, and and he 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 did believe in the goodness of of humans, mm -hmm. um, that we could uh, somehow in our collective uh, be better, right, and 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 experience a better life. Also, it wasn't abstract. You know, he wrote about people. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it wasn't just narrative. That was his mo you know his dominant mode, but. Um, and it was light on theory, uh, except for the, what, what Russell and, and Jason have, have teased out. But, um, you know, and that, and that connects the earlier journalism, too. He was fascinated by people. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what he wrote about. So I would be interested to see, following up on Julie's point, is 
who, who the selection and emphasis, who would he choose to write about? Yeah. And, you know, mm. and, and what would he see as significant mm. you know, or remarkable about those people? Thank you, everybody. And And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club and its 121st year of enlightened discussion. And anybody who would like to uh, get a copy of the book, Redemptive Dreams, and have three people sign it, uh, you can get one out in front. Thank you very much for coming. It's great to see an audience here. <laughs> Congratulations.